What does it take to turn a skeptic into a believer? I couldn't control my own body. <laughs> Mark and Rebecca Spencer are about to learn the hard way. It was about five or six seconds of sheer terror. Their dream house turns into a nightmare. <laughs> when they discover its horrific past. Hearing all those voices just really changed my life. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, nightmares become reality. Monticello, Arkansas, 2005. For the past 18 years, Mark Spencer has been a department chairman at a university in Oklahoma, but he's interviewing for a new position at the University of Arkansas. I ended up coming out here for the interview. Rebecca and the boys came with me, and we found the town charming, and I was really drawn to the sense of history here. Look at that one. While out walking one afternoon, a large mansion catches Rebecca's attention. We just looked at it in almost disbelief that a house like that existed because it was so unique. If we're gonna move here, I want that house. I was rather drawn to Monticello in a, a somewhat mysterious way, I suppose. I could have stayed where I was, which would have been safe. I would have made more money, <laughs> but I just really felt drawn to the town. The following day, Mark accepts the job. Rebecca is thrilled. She can now pursue her dream house. That afternoon, they pay a visit to the owner. I wanted that house. Short of the devil walking out the front door, I was gonna buy it. It was all kind of gloomy and, and eerie. What am I supposed to say? Well, just tell him you're the new dean of the university and you love the house. If she doesn't slam the door in your face, tell her you want to buy it. After getting a close look at the house, I was having some serious second thoughts about trying to buy it because it seemed to be in such a dilapidated state. But what Mark doesn't realize is that this house is not dead. It's very much alive. This thing shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. In the I think the idea that frightened me was that whoever owned this house would be listening to such a radio program in the middle of the afternoon. I was a little bit afraid of what the owner was going to be like. No rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and who ever receiveth the mark of his I was glad that nobody answered the door. This place looks like a money pit to me. Although the house is in disrepair, there's something about it that still fascinates Rebecca. I think he was trying to discourage me, but it didn't, it didn't work. I still wanted the house, it didn't matter. 
It didn't really matter what he said. The Spencers ask everyone they know about the house on North Main Street, hoping someone can lead them to the owner. We thought maybe we could go to a real estate agent and the real estate agent could approach the owner and see whether the owner might be interested in, in an offer. We are interested in a particular house. Mm. Great. It's the one on the corner of North Main and Oakland? You mean the Allen house? Hasn't anyone told you? It's haunted. I just figure, you know, it's a small town. Every small town has a haunted house. And she just said, well, you know, that that's not the kind of house you want to talk about. It's not, it's not for sale or anything. And the woman that owns it would never sell it anyways. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that house. I didn't immediately assume that there was something weird about the house. No, I was more inclined to think there was something weird about the real estate agent. In the meantime, Mark investigates the haunted history of the Allen house. He wonders if the rumors are true. I did an internet search one day, just, you know, typed in Allen house, Monticello, Arkansas, and a whole bunch of websites came up, and they were all about paranormal activity associated with the house. And apparently the house had had a reputation for paranormal activity for over half a century. The house was built in 1906 for Joe Lee Allen, one of the wealthiest businessmen in Arkansas. Allen had three daughters. Liddell, the middle child, was apparently his favorite. Liddell Allen got married when she was 19. The marriage didn't last. Liddell moved back to her childhood home where she lived with her mother. It was there that she committed suicide on Christmas night, 1948. No one knew why. Hello? I got a call from the owner of the house. And she said that she understood that I wanted to buy her house. She said that she would have to meet us. And after she met us, she would decide whether she would consider talking about selling the house. Mark and Rebecca will need to wait several weeks until the owner returns from an out-of-town trip. But in the meantime, they often visit the Allen house, anticipating the day they can finally go inside. Are we really going to live here? Maybe. Definitely. <laughs> oh, that must be Miss Marilyn. I saw a woman sitting in the window, and she looked like she was sitting at a desk, maybe, reading or, or writing a letter. Come on, guys, let's go. We don't want to activate the neighborhood. Watch. <laughs> I didn't want her to look and see us and then recognize us later and think, oh, well, they were stalking the house. But finally, the day comes. Mark and Rebecca will step into the Allen house for the first time. Welcome to Allen house. I'm Mark. We spoke on the phone. I definitely anticipated some sort of magic when I walked in the front door, and, and it felt that way. It felt like I was walking into something that was even better than I had imagined. The lady who owned the house had a lot of nice things. So it looked good, but it also felt good. I had a good feeling about the house. It felt warm. The second floor isn't in such good shape. This is the master bedroom. Is this the room that overlooks the street? Yes. I immediately could see that this was the second story room in which we had seen the woman in the window. And what was surprising was that we couldn't get into the room because the room was packed full of furniture and boxes. You must have done a lot of heavy lifting to get these boxes in here. We saw you sitting at the front window just a few days ago. I haven't been in this room for months. I figured that my wife and the kids and I had all experienced some sort of common optical illusion. Maybe it was a ghost. I'm sure you've heard by now that this house is haunted. 
<laughs> we don't believe in that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, but it's true. This house is haunted. She told Mark that he would hear lots of stories about it, but not to worry because she had had the house um, exercised. When I first moved in here, I could hear the ghosts talking constantly. They don't talk as much now. My response to that was that, well, she was just probably a little crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I wanted to be polite. And after all, I was trying to buy her house. So <laughs> I just kind of went along and said, oh, well, that's really interesting. <laughs> Well, we've got to be going. We've yeah. got to pick our son up from school. But thank you so much for showing us your beautiful home. Mm. Glad you like it. I think the house likes you, too. That's when she first came out and said that she was thinking of selling her palace and that God must have brought us to her because we were the types of people that she would want to sell her palace to. But yes, I think I'm supposed to do this. She said that she was surprised to find herself saying that because she never thought she would sell the house. But she had a feeling about me and Rebecca. She said that for some reason, she felt that we were meant to own it. Done. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I have to hug you. But little did they know, they're moving into a house with a very dark past. We felt that the house needed to be saved and that we were the ones to save it. Perhaps Mark and Rebecca were chosen to own the house, but just what were they chosen for? Are you ready for my house? <laughs> <laughs> Soon after the Spencer family moves in, Monticello residents start showing up hoping to get a first-hand look at the infamous haunted house. We heard that you were letting people come in to see the haunted house. They would show up at the door, and they would say, hey, we want to come and see inside. And I'm like, well, I don't know who told you you could come inside my house, but you can't. Would you have a stranger come into your house and look around? No. Sorry. I just knew right from the start when the kids started showing up at the door and then later adults showing up at the door, that the house was of interest to everybody. And there was no way I was going to be able to just say, go away and don't come back. In the following months, the Spencers concentrate on renovating the historic house. Have you been at this long? I uh, just started, actually. I convinced Lauren to take the kids. We did most of the work ourselves because we enjoy hands-on projects, but also for the financial reasons. Taking on the project and hiring someone to do every little part of it would have just been too costly. Could you run up to the attic real quick and grab me a screwdriver? No problem. I was working 50 to 60 hours a week at the university, and then every spare moment I had, I was at home working around the house. I don't think that I could have worked as hard as I did on the house if I wasn't so much in love with the house. While Mark loves the house, he's also mystified by it. The attic in particular holds great mystery. I was fascinated with the attic. In a way, I, I loved the attic, but I also was afraid of it. And I can't give you a rational explanation as to why I was afraid of it. But, but right from the start, right after we moved into the house, I, I was somewhat afraid of it. grows. Someone or something is watching him.
One of the little things that I found in the attic was half of a photograph of an infant. And on the back of it was enough of an inscription to determine that it said Miss Liddell. And I wondered, why would anybody tear a photograph of a, of a baby in half? But then, something unusual catches his eye. I stood there kind of mesmerized because it was such an interesting play of light and shadow, I thought. You know, I, was, I was trying to figure out where the light was coming from and how the, my shadow was getting cast all the way around the other side of the attic. And then what was really strange was that when I moved, my shadow did move. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I've been, I've been working too much. At the time, I was just determined really not, not to think much about it. I figured, well, there must be some explanation. I just don't have it at the moment. But who was this mysterious Liddell? The next day, Rebecca follows up and discovers that this woman grew up in the house and later died of an overdose at the age of 54. The only thing I really understood about Liddell from the newspaper was her obituary. That said the most about her. It really said that she was a very well-loved woman who cared for everyone but herself. four very heavy footsteps above me in the attic. I was absolutely certain that someone had snuck in the house and was hiding out up there. After hearing footsteps in the attic, Rebecca believes an intruder has broken in. But shortly after, the sounds of footsteps disappear. It made me pause. It made me go back and think about some of the stories people had said about the house. Things I had disregarded, things I thought were silly, now became a reality to me. Those became real stories because now they were my stories. In the following days, the Spencers discuss a more concrete problem with their new house. We have got to hire someone to come in and insulate the walls. The electric bill is getting higher and higher every month. We were quickly going broke doing these renovations. Paint and wallpaper and, and lumber, all of these things are pretty expensive. Oh, we got a letter from those uh, ghost hunter people. I'll take a letter any day over people just showing up on the front porch. I had to turn another one away today. She must have been 90, and she was pushier than the kids, <laughs> as if she expects us to give guided tours. Well, why don't we? I mean, Halloween is coming up. We could charge five bucks a head. It would help pay for the renovations. Well, when Rebecca came up with the idea of giving some tours at Halloween, I thought, well, it, it can't hurt. On Halloween night, 
the Allen House opens its doors to the public for the first time. You're not going to believe this. The line stretches all the way around the block. I thought it would be great if 50 people showed up and, and paid to tour the house. And we had 600. Welcome to Allen House. Some of the people, when they came up on the porch to wait for their turn to go in the house, were so scared that they were shaking. They thought something was going to just jump out and get them, and they were going to have a real, true, haunted experience. The Spencers have hired a group of local students to lead the tours. All right, first group, follow me, please. One of those students is Shane Curry. That first group was really more interested in, like, the ghost stories. That's what they really came for. You've all heard about Liddell Allen who supposedly haunts this house. This is the room where she killed herself, right over there. It was Christmas Eve, 1948. Caddy Allen, Liddell's mother, was hosting her annual Christmas party. Liddell was, of course, in attendance. Good to see you. We had heard some accounts of the Christmas party of Liddell seeming a lot more somber than she usually was. By the end of the party, Liddell appeared disheartened, but no one could understand why an otherwise cheerful woman seemed so depressed. At one point late in the evening, she prepared herself a plate of hors d'oeuvres and a glass of punch, and she went upstairs. Late that very same night, Liddell decided to end her own life. She suffered for about a week before she finally passed away. Her mother came home and sealed up this room. No one came in here for the next 37 years until the Allen family sold the house. That's when the ghost stories began. You don't actually believe those stories, do you? In the middle of the story, the lights flickered and a shirt flew out of the closet. <laughs> nice trick. Did you rig that up with some wires or something? I didn't do that. Everyone looked at me like, you know, how did you do that? That was cool. I'm like, that I don't know how that just happened. Yeah, right. See for yourself. And I'm freaking out because I don't know why that just happened. He goes and he looks and there's nothing in there but a pile of clothes. I don't want to be in here anymore. People were definitely freaked out once they realized that that was not, you know, a gimmick, that we hadn't planned for a shirt to fly out the closet. Some of them wanted to go ahead and leave. Some of them wanted to hurry up and finish the tour. It is obvious that Liddell does not care for the idea of strangers touring her home. And she'll make sure they'll never come back. to DestinationAmerica.com. A simple tour of the haunted Allen House has turned into much more than anyone planned. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I saw her. She's still here. Who? Liddell. We had an older lady on the tour who came up to me as she was leaving the house and, and told me that when she was on the second floor, she saw a, a lady in a Victorian dress. She was saying, 
She thought she had seen Liddell. Why is she so sad? I, I, I don't know. People who came on the tour, they all wanted to know what our ideas were or what we knew about Liddell's suicide. And the fact is, nobody knew why she had committed suicide. Thank you so much for opening your house to us. I'll never forget this. Oh, I saw her, I saw her. <laughs> After the excitement of Halloween, the Spencers returned to their routines, still working hard to make the house their own. But someone is intent on distracting them. Put the needle down it stopped instantly and what's odd about that is that it's it's wound up with a spring so if someone had actually wound it up and you were to put the needle down it would either play or it would just slowly wind itself out but it stopped instantly so it wasn't wound at all rebecca goes upstairs to tell her husband what she saw but something stops her dead in her tracks was controlling me. I had to feel what it wanted me to feel. Rebecca! It was about five or six seconds of almost sheer terror. What's wrong? I saw something. A ghost. It's as if Liddell is trying to tell her something. But what? I still wasn't really convinced, I guess, uh, for myself. I, it wasn't that I, I thought that she was crazy, but I suppose I just wanted to see it for myself. I think maybe it's time we let one of those paranormal groups come and investigate. I wanted concrete evidence of paranormal activity before I was going to be able to say, yeah, this house is haunted. The Spencers invite a team of paranormal experts from Louisiana Spirits to conduct an investigation of the Allen House. Among the investigators is Bess Maxwell. You could feel the history of that house, and you could feel could feel the house. I don't know that I've ever been any other place that you could just feel the spirit of the house like the Allen house. We really didn't understand what the protocol was for having paranormal investigators in one's home. So we sent the kids off to friends' houses for the night, and Rebecca and I decided that we would go out and leave the house to the investigators. We've never left anyone alone in the house before. <laughs> Don't worry. We do this kind of thing all the time. We'll be fine. Rebecca Spencer's concerns were she always felt that the Allen house had its own distinct personality. She looked at the house as being almost a person in and of itself. And she was just kind of worried that, the, as strange as it sounds, the house would not like us being there. You ready? I guess so. That night, I felt that something was a little off. Mark felt something was a little off. We just weren't sure what to do, so we chose to leave. But I think we both knew right from the start that we shouldn't do that. Are you all right? I felt a little 
dizzy coming down the stairs. I, I didn't think too much of it at the time. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I need to eat or something. But I did, I, I, I felt like the air was suddenly charged in some way. <sighs> I'm okay, come on. But Mark is far from okay. Perhaps it's a warning of events yet to come. After Mark and Rebecca leave for the evening, the investigators continue their attempt to solve the Allen House mystery. The attic has always been the focal point of a lot of the activity in the house. Bess uses an EMF meter to pick up on electronic frequencies. When it lights up, it suggests the presence of spiritual activity. that one of the other investigators was coming up behind me and had just said her name. She had not been behind me. So where the voice came from, I don't know. Meanwhile, Rachel Ellis sets up a camera in the master bedroom. I could hear a lady singing really softly, but there was nobody in there with me. Maybe nobody inside. It was like lightning all around the house. What happened? I don't know. Everything is dead except the audio recorders. All electricity went out. There was no electricity whatsoever, but our recorders were still up. I saw sparks outside just before the lights went out. It must have been a transformer. The neighbors still have power. Then we realized that, well, it could have been the transformer because we were the only house with no electricity. The houses next door on either side, the house across the street, their lights were on. So it was just us. I better call Rebecca. Mm -hmm. We were just a few blocks from the house when my phone rang, and it was one of the investigators. My immediate feeling was I knew it. I knew we shouldn't have left the house. What happened? Come on, follow me. I want to show you something. Here, be careful. And watch the wire. Without any probable explanation, a branch has fallen on the power lines. I'm not a big believer in coincidences, so it just seemed too odd to just say, well, it was just a limb just happened to fall off the tree just as we were about to begin our investigation. It was just too strange. It's perfectly still. There's no breeze. It's not raining. The tree limb is a big, leafy limb, or what appears to be a perfectly healthy tree. Since most of the equipment that the investigators use is electrical, the blackout effectively ends the investigation. A few days later, Bess Maxwell returns with surprising news. We take this a few seconds after the power went out. During their investigation, they record several disembodied voices known as electronic voice phenomena. What happened? I don't know. Everything is dead except the audio recorders. I saw sparks outside just before the lights went out. It must have been a transformer. No, not transformer. Hearing all those voices just really freaked me out. The neighbors still have power. I better call Rebecca. I've never heard anything like this. And there are more. Hearing all the EVPs that LA Spirits had recorded during their investigation really changed my life, I think. For me, 
the truly amazing thing about this is that the voice seems to be responding to us in the moment as if it hears what we're saying and it's trying to talk to us. A lot of the things that we do deal with residual hauntings, which are not intelligent hauntings. It's just like something playing all over and over and over on a tape recorder. You can get EVPs from that too, but this was not that. Uh, this was an intelligent haunting. Uh, this was a spirit in the house that had an agenda. This spirit wants something from us. What does it want? Well, that's what we have to find out. We thought if maybe if we could reveal why Liddell killed herself and what was going on with her, maybe then she would be done with her earthly business. The Spencers continue to be haunted by unanswered questions about the suicide of Liddell Allen Bonner. It's a mystery they cannot ignore. Marcus tried to understand things rationally, but now his instincts take over. One Saturday morning, I woke up and I immediately felt the compulsion to go to the attic. I was arguing with myself that there wasn't any reason to go to the attic because I had scoured the attic many times and I was convinced that I had found everything that there was to be found. But this voice in my head just was nagging me, you've got to go to the attic. that opening and at first I didn't see anything still there's you know like this voice in my head telling me look closer and it was almost like a hand was on my shoulder pushing me down large brown envelope and it was full of smaller white envelopes and these were all letters and they were all postmarked in 1948 and they were all addressed to Liddell Allen Bonner they were all written to her obviously in the last year of her life I thought that I was dreaming I, I really was waiting to wake up Mark is one step closer to solving the mystery as he's about to discover the shocking truth of Miss Liddell Allen. Mark. Mark. After trying to decipher the paranormal disturbances in the house, Mark is led to the attic and discovers a stash of hidden letters. The truth behind Liddell's suicide is finally before him. Mark. Mark. Mark? I literally blinked fast several times, and it was Rebecca coming toward me. What's wrong? I think that the transition between seeing Liddell and then seeing Rebecca, I think that it, it was meant that way. I, I think that Liddell was probably using Rebecca's energy to show herself to me. 
I know why Liddell killed herself. Later that afternoon, Mark and Rebecca read through all 82 letters, hoping to unveil the mystery behind Liddell's secret past. Obviously, these were letters from a man who was madly in love with Liddell. You certainly are as near the Dell I knew years ago as you could possibly be. Liddell's admirer was a gentleman named Prentice Hemingway Savage. Prentice was vice president of Texaco Oil in 1948. He lived in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but he had grown up here in Monticello. Liddell and Prentice dated as teenagers. Years later, as adults, they rekindled their love. Hello, Adele. But this time, something was different. Prentice was married. In July 1948, Liddell arranged to meet Prentice in Milwaukee. It ended on a promise to spend the rest of their lives together. Liddell returned home, and they began making plans through a series of letters. But then, Prentice stopped writing. Reality just got in the way. And this man couldn't leave his wife because he couldn't accept the scandal that his wife would stir up in the newspapers because he was vice president of Texaco Oil. And on Christmas night, 1948, Liddell finally sealed her fate. I think that she hoped that Prentice would arrive, would, would show up, would surprise her. The man she loved never arrived. Her dreams were broken, and she gave up hope of ever being happy again. I'm reading these letters full of these wild promises and declarations of love, but I know how it ends. She knew he wasn't coming back. I felt sad for her. And at the same time, I felt a sort of happiness that now we knew. And obviously, she wanted us to know. We would not have discovered those letters any other way. She had to have wanted us to, to know the story. She had nothing left, and she couldn't pretend anymore. We'll make sure everybody knows that. From the first moment we saw the house till now, all of it has felt like it was destiny or some sort of fate that brought us to this town. I really feel like, like we are where we're supposed to be. What I think I've experienced following my discovery of the letters is a greater awareness of Liddell's presence. I think that connection she made with me the day that I discovered the letters has, you know, opened a sort of door. Um, and, and there is a, a connection between me and her. Mark has no doubt that Liddell has chosen him to tell her story. He decides to write a book about his experiences, the house, and the truth behind the untimely death of Liddell Allen Bonner. Chris Gibbons thinks he's found the house of his dreams, but it soon becomes a house of horrors. That house, it's his, and he doesn't want you in it. An evil spirit infects Chris's every waking moment, and when night comes, things take an even darker turn. I would hear my dad screaming in the middle of the night. Stop! To defeat the entity, Chris will need to summon unimaginable strength to save his home, his family, and his sanity. In America, there is real evil. It lurks in the darkest shadows in our most ordinary towns. Between the worlds we see and the things we fear, there are doors. When they are opened, 
nightmares become reality. I ask for whatever lives in this cabinet to be ripped from the earth and sent to a place where evil lives. I ask for whatever lives in this cabinet to be ripped from the earth and sent to a place where evil lives. You gonna play some music for mommy? Yeah! Oh, good. Is everybody ready? Yeah. The Gibbons family plays traditional Irish music at events in their hometown of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Chris, an attorney, and his wife Kay have four children, Andrew, Samuel, Sarah, and Patrick. Chris believes the band is an important family activity. The family band puts everyone in a position where, in order to make music, you have to work together. The family has no idea, but working together just may save their lives later on. The Gibbons have outgrown their old house, and Chris thinks he's found a perfect new one in a neighborhood called Heritage Hill. Heritage Hill is a nationally recognized historic district. All of the houses have to be maintained in their uh, original condition, so it is, to a degree, a step back in time. The house seems to fit the family's size requirement. The house was large, it had great bones, everything seemed to be in place. It just needed a lot of love and attention. Come on, imagine what it's gonna look like when I'm done with it. I was getting a hankering to take on a new project. It took nine years to renovate their old house, Kay does not want to spend another nine on this project. The house needed a tremendous amount of work, and this was a great concern to me because I just wanted to move in and get on with life. Now, I know this is your dream house, but the kids need a house they can live in. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll get it done in a year if that makes you happy. Really? Now, when would you sleep? I knew he could do it. Because he's crazy that way. If he sets his mind into something, he's going to do it. I made the offer that day to purchase the house. Chris works nights and weekends to get the house ready to move in. The one-year ticking clock for renovation begins. A week after buying the house, Chris is in the basement, clearing out the previous owner's junk. There was quite a bit of the workshop material left. I decided to hang on to some of the hand tools because they appeared as though they might be useful. You never know. Little does Chris know the significance of the former owner's possessions. Chris works in the basement past midnight. He feels someone or something watching him. There would be a sensation that someone or something was kind of like hanging over you, but there really isn't anything there. Chris attributes this sensation to exhaustion. A few months later, the Gibbons family moves into the house. What do you think? Is it big? Is it amazing? Yeah. You like that? Huh? It's huge. Biggest kid, biggest room. <laughs> it's the kid's first good look at the house. Sarah Gibbons is seven years old. She appears in shadow to protect her privacy. The first time I saw the house, I remember I thought it was huge, like a castle, like it was for, made for royalty. The major renovation projects are done, but Chris still has to put on the finishing touches. Two nights later, Chris is up long after the family is asleep, 
restoring the living room to its former glory. just couldn't figure out what possibly could have moved enough air to have unsecured the plastic in the first place. The next morning, Kay makes breakfast for the children. Where is your brother? Upstairs. My little man. Are you ready for some breakfast? Can you go to the spot at the table? Another spot at the table? What? <laughs> Your little robot. <laughs> Help, I will be in my womb. My son wasn't really scared. He just like, hmm, there's a man in this room. What man in your room? With his hair like this. All right, well, young man, it is time for you to stop fooling around and have your breakfast. <laughs> I thought it was just a figment of his imagination. I was just thinking he made it up. That's what little kids do. Three months after moving into the house, Chris finishes the restoration of the living room. You guys ready? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Here we go. Phase yeah. one of the restoration is complete. Ahead of schedule. Can we come see? Come on in, let's okay. go. The work and the result exceeded my expectations. It was a lot for Chris. He had a full law practice. He renovated the house, but he made it work. He got it done, and he's the man. And I knew that the rest of the work was going to be done within a year. I think I'm going to take a nap. <laughs> you deserve one. <laughs> It was in the middle of the night and not the afternoon. What happened? <sighs> uh, nothing. It was, it was just a crazy dream. I mean, it's kind of an odd dream to have, but who knows what your subconscious can cook up. Chris is afraid to explain to Kay what he actually saw in his dreams. They fall back asleep, unaware that their real nightmare is just beginning. Chris and Kay Gibbons are renovating their dream home, unaware they have stirred up much more than a century of dust. 
On the same night that Chris has a horrifying nightmare, Kay experiences her own chilling reality. It felt like a hand was on my ankle and moving up my leg, like somebody was rubbing my leg. Why? No. I think we have mice. I've been over every inch of this house. We have no mice. No, there was something crawling up my leg. Look, there's nothing. It wasn't a mouse. It wasn't Chris. I didn't know what else it could be. So we went back to sleep, and that was that. A few nights later, Chris is once again having trouble sleeping. I felt near my head tapping on my pillow as though someone were pushing on it, you know, with a finger. You don't really know what to think of that at first. And you think, well, whatever. And it happens again. Chris and Kay have the same paranormal experience, independent of each other. Over the next few weeks, Chris and Kay try to ignore the bizarre incidents in their home. Chris continues working half days in his law practice, restoring the house in the afternoons and evenings. As I hit the ground, I wake up completely unnerved in an utter state of panic. I felt as though all of that actually happened to me. I felt completely assaulted. It was, to me, a real assault. Over the next month, Chris is haunted by nightmares of his own death that blur the line between his dream world and reality. Stop! Get out! Okay. Chris suspects the recurring dreams are paranormal in nature. I concluded that there was uh, an entity, the spirit in my home, that did not want me there. And the fact that I couldn't see it and couldn't fight it didn't mean I didn't feel a desire to defend myself. To me, it was an assault. Chris does not reveal to his children his suspicions that the house may be haunted. He does not want to scare them. But Chris's secret can't be kept for long.
was upstairs playing guitar and then all of a sudden just clapping. All right, Andrew, son, come on, calm down. All right, the house is 100 years old. I mean, every now and then you're gonna get a pop and a crack. But not in perfect rhythm. We tried to tell him there's a logical explanation for your experience. And he was quite adamant that there was not a logical explanation for what he had experienced. The logical explanation is this house is haunted. Kay and I had reached the point where we believed we were dealing with a spiritual problem in terms of a ghost. Our initial reaction to our son was to waylay his fears. We certainly weren't going to do anything to encourage the idea that there's a ghost in the house and it was in his room haunting him. But he really wasn't buying it. Chris and Kay realize they can no longer try to ignore the strange activity. We have to do something. I'm working on it. We decided I would call the priest because we felt that we had a spiritual problem on our hands that was beyond our capability to deal with. Hey, Father, how you doing? Morning, Chris. Chris finds even broaching the subject of a ghost difficult. Well, we've been having some issues at the house. I informed him that the entire household was experiencing odd occurrences, that it was disruptive to the house. My son, we're, we're all spiritual beings, but ghosts as you're describing them, I'm afraid they don't exist. My suggestion would be for you to go home and pray with your family. The priest declines Chris's request for a blessing of the house. Well, thank you, Father. I appreciate your time. But to battle the supernatural in his own home, Chris will have to find his own strength within and unite his family in the fight. We felt like we were on our own. This was our problem, and we were going to have to solve it. The Gibbons family is trying to come to grips with a dark spirit that seems to be haunting their house. Chris Gibbons goes to the library and checks out every book he can find on ghosts and hauntings. I did what I naturally do, which is try to define the problem, define what it is I'm dealing with. What is the risk? What is this spirit capable of? I had really no idea. Can it attack my family physically? I mean, the idea that there can be ghosts that start fires and your house burns down, or people get pushed down the stairs, or the idea of a spiritual possession. What's all this stuff? <sighs> Research. I mean, I've got to figure out what we're up against. I didn't want a full-scale war in my house with a spirit. What's in this folder? I pulled some of the city records. For more clues, Chris pulls city hall records on the house's history. He discovers the century-old home had just three owners before he bought it. Then, he finds something intriguing. Yeah, here you go. Chris has no idea he is looking at a photo of the man his son had seen in the hallway. That's who Sarah talked about. Chris and Kay decide to ask neighbors about the home's previous owners. I knew the family that lived here. They lived here a long time. They learned the most recent were a married couple who lived there for 50 years. The husband died in the home 20 years earlier. The widow remained until she moved into a nursing home just before the Gibbons family moved in. Thank you, folks. Appreciate it. I think I know what's going on with our ghost. You no, know, what if it's the dead husband of the widow? Theory for me was that maybe because his wife had not passed, he was kind of lingering behind, waiting for his wife to join him on the other side before passing on. What are you thinking? I think I want whatever's in this house out and gone. Chris and Kay have a hard choice to make. Lie to the children to keep them calm, or be honest. Christopher and I decided we need to tell the kids that we think there's spirits in the house. Heavenly Father. At last, Chris and Kay acknowledge what the children have known and been talking about for weeks. We decided that we would pray as a family, 
We would pray for the sanctity of our home. We would pray for lost souls. Amen. Amen. When we prayed together, it definitely made me feel safer. After the prayer, paranormal activity in the house seems to stop for several months. Family life resumes as normal. We're thinking, well, this is good. You know, the spirit left. Months later, Chris is at a neighbor's party. As entertainment, a psychic offers free readings. What's up with that? She's a psychic. Yeah. She'll tell your fortune. Yeah, that's what I need is a fortune. <laughs> Come on, it's just for fun. Nah, I man, I don't believe in stuff like you that. You look like you could use some fun. Oh. How's it going? You might want to take a little easy on me. I just, I really don't believe in this stuff. Are you trying to restore the past? The past of a grand old house? She was perceiving my house. So I became very interested in what this psychic had to say. Give me something from it. Do you have a key? The psychic hones in on the spirit living in Chris's house. There's someone unwanted in your house. Someone not living. She says it's a former owner and that he is very attached to the property. He's a lost soul. And I asked her, why won't he leave? I asked her if the ghost were waiting for his wife to pass before crossing over. No! I hate that woman! The psychic becomes momentarily possessed by the spirit haunting Chris's home. I'm sorry. That wasn't me. Her response was, he's not waiting for her. He's just in the house because that's his place. He loved living in that house, and it's his, and he doesn't want you in it. Chris's encounter with the psychic seems to reignite his conflict with the entity in his home. Chris starts having his dreams again, these nightmarish dreams. Chris's recurring death dreams are back, only this time. They are more frequent and more violent. You get to the point you don't want to go to bed because you know what's coming. What's coming is a horrible experience where you're being brought to a physical violent death. The entire family now feels the strain of the paranormal entity in their home. Sarah often has trouble sleeping. No one felt comfortable in the home. When you were alone in the house, you'd hear the knob shake a little bit, and then you'd hear footsteps or, yeah, you know, just creepy sounds. You, you tried to blame it on the wind, but it really wasn't the wind. DestinationAmerica.com Chris Gibbons is terrorized by an unseen entity in his dreams. But his family now fears their waking hours. He looked at me for well, it was probably like three seconds, but it seemed like forever that he was staring at me. I was absolutely terrified. Hey, princess, what's going on? Hey. 
What's the matter? It's okay, you can tell me. I... I saw the ghost. Where? Standing in the doorway. Chris instantly knows that the entity in his dreams is the same one appearing to his children. He has slick back hair. News that the ghost has physically appeared to his daughter affects Chris even more than the terror he experiences in his dreams. It attacks his core mission as a father. When the ghost involves the children, you know, that dynamic changes because now the people I'm supposed to protect, I'm not protecting. Chris is not sure how to protect his family against something he doesn't understand. He continues the restoration of his house. This he knows how to do. The dream of being suffocated was the worst one yet. Why don't you go upstairs, try to get some rest? For what? So we can do it again? The nightmare is an escalation that makes sleep almost impossible. Everybody likes to go to bed when they're tired. Everybody likes to wake up rested. The assaults in the dreams act to deprive you of that basic kind of normal human function. A week later, Chris and Kay have two friends over for drinks. Yeah, we're trying. You know, it's, uh, it's been a labor of love. <laughs> I was listening to everybody. It was really nice to have friends over. We have a lot of and I couldn't take it anymore. It's been very hard. Kay is really kind of the rock in the house. For her to have an emotional breakdown like this, just out of the blue, was very unusual. Hey, what's wrong? I didn't want to tell you. What happened? Earlier that day, Kay had an experience in the basement. I had a feeling that something was not right. Kay senses that the ghost is showing her a scene from the past, a mysterious image of violence committed against a ghost child. I could feel her. I could feel her soul. She was scared. She was not existent, but she mattered. It was horrible. I think something horrible happened in this house. Kay fears that the ghost, while living, may have abused a child in their basement. She has no idea who the child might have been. I absolutely perceived that event to be a threat to my wife and my children. Absolutely. I know someone who might help. Their friend suggests they contact a local spiritual healer. Well, we're Catholic. I mean, we just can't. At this point, I was looking for any help I could get. At this point, we'll just, we'll try anything, I guess. The next day, the spiritual healer and her husband, who works with her, arrive. The healer has agreed to share her story anonymously as she rarely becomes involved in the cleansing of spirits from a home. When I initially got the call, I was 
concerned about the whole family. So it was primarily my intuition that said, I need to go right away. Perfectly restored. Did you do the work yourself? One of the first questions she asked me was, had we been renovating in the house? Yes. Why? Do you think it has something to do with what's going on? The entity was present in the house when they bought the house, when they renovated the house and disturbed all of the dark places, that's when this energy became much more active. There was a very strong draw to the basement. Something in the basement was not right. I can sense Do you feel what I feel? Very much. You need to you need to stay back here. You two need to stay back here. We walk into that room with the intention of getting rid of that thing and it knows that immediately. It doesn't have to be told that out loud. It was very clear where it was emanating from immediately. Can we open that? Yeah. Go ahead. They identified that the ghost was in the cupboard, and they had told me he's in that cupboard. The spiritual healers believe they have cornered a ghost, the dark energy that has been terrorizing the Gibbons family in their home. It's the same closet from which Chris was attacked in one of his dreams. No matter what happens, just stay there, okay? tried to push back, and it tried to find ways out of the circle that we were creating around it. And we just kept pushing, pushing. Until eventually it shot out the window all at once. It's outside now. Should I get rid of his workbench and all his old tools? It's a good idea. Make sure you put it outside the boundary line, though. There may have been some attachment by this entity to his personal things that remained in the house. So if we wanted to avoid that connection, then we had to move that connection off of the property. The spiritual healer suspects the ghost may be still lurking outside. Chris wants to remove the workbench and tools, anything tangible that may have been connected to the ghost when it was alive. The workbenches down there have been built by him. I hope he would face the same fate that his bench had, which is destruction. And so what we're going to do is create a perimeter here where we're going to want the negative energies to stay over here and the positive energies on that side. Now, the task of creating this boundary is... Most they use a water-based solution, different salts, sands, and herbs. You're the nurturer. You're going to be the one to protect this house. Anyone can do the sealing of the property, but it's best given to the mother. This comes from the tradition and the understanding that it is women who create and hold space. Okay, are you ready to put your heart and soul into this? She told me, I have to take control. I have to tell the ghost to leave and he can't come back. It has to come through my heart, my mind, my soul, and I have to mean it. This is our house. 
No negative energies are welcome here. What we are creating is an energetic wall that those negative energies cannot cross back in. This is our house. I felt very empowered to know that I'm a part of getting this ghost out of our house and never to return again. And our friends. As Kay completes the perimeter, Chris brings the last of the previous owner's belongings to the curb. All this junk, it's yours, it's like you, it's gone. It's all going to the dump, why don't you follow it? My intent about this ghost was hostile. Sick of this. See all this stuff? It's yours. In my heart, that ghost could rot. If you feed an entity through negative emotions like fear or anger, it can create a doorway for it to re-enter. You're baiting it. You're asking it for a fight. The children are invited back into the house to celebrate and seal the cleansing. Okay, I want you to think positive thoughts. I want you to think light being all around us, okay? We called in all of the energies of the universe that are within sacred law that bring light and love, and we attempted to fill that house with as much love and light as we possibly could so that there wasn't room for any darkness in the house anywhere. May there be no more darkness in this house. No more darkness. May there be only light. Only light. Thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for preparing us. No, thank you. I'm glad I could help. I think the cleanse worked. I mean, instantaneously. I mean, you knew. You knew. You could feel it. We felt peace in our house. It's the first time since we've moved into the house that I felt like we were us again. I felt a sincere sense of relief. Four weeks later, the cleansing still holds. Chris, now rested, takes up running again, only to be watched by a familiar figure. For Chris Gibbons, an early morning jog becomes a run-in with terror. The ghost he banished from his property months ago is lurking just a few blocks away. There was no doubt in my mind that that was the ghost. If it's still hanging around, then it's still attached to that environment in some way, shape, or form. That would mean that this entity was trying to cross back across and get back into Chris's house. May God rebuke him. We humbly pray. Fearing a return of the ghost, Chris leads his family on a nightly cleansing of the house. I made it my point to cleanse the house. And I also mixed my own Catholic traditions with Catholic prayers. For the ruin of lost soul. Amen. Chris performs the cleansing ritual every night for weeks, but the family tires of it. You know, I was thinking tonight we could really focus on the third floor. Chris would come home from work and say, let's do the ritual. And I'm like, I don't want to do the ritual anymore. I'm done with this ritual. This is no way to live. I quit. I gave up. I mean, the kids and I need you. That's fine. Do so the ghost had defeated me. Chris continues the cleansing ritual alone. I ask for whatever lives in this cabinet to be ripped from the earth and sent to a place where evil lives. I ask for whatever lives in this cabinet to be ripped from the earth and sent to a place where evil lives. Chris consciously realizes he's in another of his terror dreams and he can control his movements. Oh, I know what's going on. I'm in a paranormal dream. You're not gonna get me this time. It's sent to a place where evil lives! When 
I hit him, you know, with my fist, it felt good. Yeah, I like to think I'm a peaceful person, really, at my heart. And here I am, horribly beating someone senseless, you know. And I thought, you know, this is what I've come to. Chris realizes that he has tried every approach to attack and defend against the entity, except one, letting go of his anger toward the ghost. And putting my anger down and trying to deal with this spirit, I really did come to see us as equal creations. He exists because God created him. I exist because God created me. I really called on everything that I thought was good and right in the universe to come here and to show him and to encourage him to do something about making a different choice for himself. Dear Lord, please confirm upon the lost soul in this house all of your love and light. When I approached this spirit with a sense of loving intent and a sense of forgiveness, when I made that shift, that was the end of it, as far as I was concerned. Chris believes the entity has left their home. Amen. I loved him out, because I couldn't make him leave. The family may never be able to prove that the ghost is gone. But years have passed since the haunting, and the Gibbons clan has seen no sign of the entity that threatened to destroy them. It was out of love that the ghost left. And it was out of love that we stayed together through the whole thing. Hey, are we ready to make some music? I think yeah. having survived this haunting, that we as a family have gotten really close. Can I get an amen? Amen! One, two, three, four! Our kids, I think, are very proud of us for what we've, we've gone through and what we've done to get rid of the ghost, especially their father. But for the patriarch of the Gibbons clan, the lack of definitive proof that the ghost has permanently disappeared will always leave haunting doubts. I don't know that it's over. I mean, I don't know what choice the ghost made. I hope that he has truly moved on. But if he wants to come back, I know how to deal with him.